Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast. And they, they shouted, they shouted Jew at me, and uh, in, in Arabic, Yehudi. And uh, they, they sort of picked up a, a can of Pepsi and chucked it at my head. Um, I had no idea what was going on. I saw some flags um, around of, of groups that that you know some would call terrorists, uh, others would call freedom fighters. But um, I, I sort of knew the te- there was a lot of tension in the place, and this this can of Pepsi that was full hit me in the head. My next guest is an aspiring adventurer. He has done some remarkable expeditions from walking the Holy Land and walking Malta, along with a load of others. On today's show, we talk about his trip across the Holy Land and some of the amazing moments he had. I am delighted to introduce George Keppard to the show. Thank you. Yeah, how are you? I'm very well, very well. Well, you're an aspiring explorer who's probably done more trips than most of my audience and myself put together and you're only 19 (laughs) which is truly incredible um and i mean you've done stuff from walking the holy lands to source to sea or brisbane but i I think we'll probably get into that later on let's start with you and how you got into all these adventures yeah so um i was born in i was born in the uk um and grew up in germany and australia and um from a very early age, my parents would take me up into the, the so sort of the local mountain near where we grew up, and um, and yeah, ever since then that was that sort of gave birth to my my love of adventure, and um, I just I kept wanting to build on the last trip, build on the last trip, and um, so I started with some small expeditions in and around where I grew up in Australia, and um, then I did walking the Holy Land, which was um, 800 kilometers across Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. And since then, I've done a few trips in and around the Middle East and Europe. And um, and yeah, that's, um, that's my background in, in adventure. Yeah. Wow. And so do you feel that with you, you said you were brought up in England, moved around from Germany to Australia. Do you think that sort of moving around is what sort of gave you this freedom to sort of want to explore it was the fact that you didn't see any um boundaries to you going to these different countries because you were moving so freely from such a young age yeah i think i think that's a big reason and and when i'm on these these trips and everything i don't i don't particularly get homesick because you know i I grew up in in three countries so there's there's not so much you know I'll, i'll miss my family i'll miss my friends but but missing an actual country or or, or the, the places or anything like that. Not not so much, but um, it's, it's def- it definitely helps. I'm not sure if that's the reason, but but it definitely helps. So I mean, you you've done so many trips. Uh, probably the best place to start is with your main one, which was the walking the Holy Lands. Why did you decide on this trip? Um. Yeah. So I was in I was in year 12 economics class in Australia and um, I was quite bored and uh, I knew I wanted to do something quite big um, and go somewhere where people wouldn't necessarily go and do something that people wouldn't necessarily do after I graduated. So I looked into a bunch of places and I love the Middle East. I I studied it a lot in in senior history and and, uh, yeah, because of that, I chose Israel and Palestine and Jordan and and thought, you know, why not walk across it? So... um, yeah, that was it. So what, it, where where did you start on the trip? So I started in um, a town called Akka in the uh, in the north of the country. And um, and from there, it was three days um, across uh, northern Israel. Then I entered the West Bank, um, in the West Bank for about two weeks. And then um, after that, uh, yeah, through Jordan and three more weeks down to the, um, the Gulf of Aqaba. Got yeah. it. And I mean, I suppose being a Westerner and hearing the sort of news about the West Bank and everything, was there not a sort of fear? At, because you were, what, 17 when you did this? Yes. Yeah. And was, I'm, uh, I'm sure, <laughs> like, like myself, you see on the news about the West Bank and Israel, it sort of seems to be this uh, sort of slightly war-torn area. Yeah, and there is, you know, one of political 
controversy from time to time. So was there not a sort of fear going into it? There was, yeah, I was, I was very scared. Um, I think my mum was probably more scared than me, but, um, but you know, that, that sort of, I had no idea what the West Bank was going to be like. All I knew about it was, was what I heard on the news. Um, it turned out it wasn't that way, but, but you know, that especially the first day I went into the West Bank, I was extremely scared. I was, I was, you know, fearful of my life. Like these guys, what if they think I'm Israeli or, or what if, you know, any other thing. So yeah, it was, it was quite scary at first, but you get into it and you, you prove your, pre, uh, your preconceptions wrong and um, it all works out in the end. Yeah, I completely agree. We we had Nick Butters on recently who we were sort of talking about this as well. He was going f- he was running in Syria and had all these sort of preconceptions of war-torn areas and the reality of going to these countries is you see the locals, you meet the locals and you find that they are incredibly friendly. How did the locals treat you? Incredibly. Um I, I always say that the hospitality I experienced on this trip was was second to none. Um, they treat guests sacredly. Um, when I was in Jordan, especially, um, I would never, basically, never pay for accommodation when I was in when I was in small villages and everything because they would invite me into their houses and and let me sleep there, and it was it was just incredible. It was it was amazing. Wow. So you were going from northern Israel into the West Bank and then further on. Yeah, so um, when I got midway down to the to, to Jericho, midway in the West Bank, I um, I crossed the border into Jordan, and then and then from Jordan, I walked down to uh, Aqaba, in uh, yeah, at the, at the southernmost tip of the country. Yeah. And so, what was the sort of feeling um, you had? Because you had the language barrier. I know that you are studying Arabic at the moment. Yeah. Um, was there an issue with the language barrier? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, at first, especially. Um, I learned all the the basic Arabic greetings before, and and I could read about half of the Arabic alphabet, which is which is pretty useless if you don't know the other half. But um, but yeah, I mean, I could I could say I'm walking from here to here. I knew the words for for water and food and and everything. So the very basics were fine. But um, but having you know deep conversations or anything like that that was difficult. The English over there is quite good, um, especially in in Palestine. It's actually very very good. Um, in Jordan, not so much, but in the cities where the tourists go, then, then everyone will speak English. But um, I didn't find it too difficult towards the end, especially to, to communicate. What were the sort of moments along the way which you look back on in sort of fond memory? Oh, I mean, um, getting into Jerusalem was was really, really special. Um, and that was that's one of the ones that, that sticks out. There was also... Um, Near Nablus in the West Bank, there's a um, uh, there's a there's an old Roman fort, and um, I was walking there, and um, the the local men from the Palestinian village, they were they were sort of re- rebuilding the castle to turn it into a tourist attraction, and um, they, you know, the the village leader, the elder, was there, and and he spoke a bit of English, so he's coming to me, and. And he was he was just telling me about all the people that walked along the same route I was walking on, you know, Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, oh not Moses, um, Abraham, um, all these all these different prophets from um, from from the Bible and you know, conquerors like Alexander the Great, and that was just that moment of realization of, of you know how how significant this route is. That's another one, and and getting into the desert, the deserts. I fell in love with the desert when I was there. It's um, it's so peaceful and. You know, nothing's happening around you, and there's sort of there's an aroma of death, but it, there's some sort of there's there's some sort of beauty in that death, which which I quite like. Yeah. Did you say were you wild camping in the sort of desert? Yes, in the in the desert, I had a few nights wild camping. Um, if there was uh, like a Bedouin campsite or or a small guest house or something, I would stay there because you know I tend to get smelly quite quickly on these walks. So <laughs> any shower is um is welcome. So so I, if if I can, I'll, I'll stay in in a bed. But if not, then add my tent and um and everything like that. Yeah. You said there's something quite sort of um, peaceful about the sort of aroma of death. Yeah, it's. It's just Explain. the absolute silence that the absolute silence and 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 lifelessness. You you just really feel completely alone, and 
you know, especially Wadi Rum, where you've got these these massive sandstone, um, these massive sandstone rocks everywhere, and it really gives you a sense of perspective. You know, that your life doesn't doesn't really mean anything. It's sort of ego death, I suppose. Um, and um, yeah, just just absolute peace. So much time to reflect about everything, and and it's it's no other environment is like the desert. It's it's incredible. Yeah, I, I there's something to be said about just sort of going out into these wild places like the desert on your own and wild camping, this the sort of eerie silence I think is really sort of what blissful is probably yeah. the word I'm going for. Yeah, for sure. It's something I yeah. don't think people can sometimes understand, the idea of going out alone in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It's, it's it's incredible. It's I'm... I'm want to get back to the desert as soon as I can <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you at the moment you're stuck in lockdown in Holland. stuck in the Netherlands yeah, yeah yeah so in in the Hague it's where I study um and uh yeah it's 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 not a bad place to be it's not not the best place to be but you know I'm happy that I'm safe I can work still and and it's it's all good yeah oh, amazing and what what do you think it is about going alone because you've done a lot of these walking trips what is it about walking alone which you like? I think it's it's the the headspace that, that I get. It's the, the peacefulness and and just being able to think about about anything for just hours and hours and hours and and then so that's sort of the mental aspect of it. But then when you are alone, you're a lot more you're a lot more vulnerable and and as a result of that, the people that you meet are a lot more accommodating to you. They don't see you as a threat in any way or or anything like that so yeah it's just multiple factors but it's just that 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 headspace and and the vulnerability which which i find incredible or just try i i find sometimes trying to convince people to come on these trips hard enough (laughs) when you're like yeah i'm gonna gonna walk for a month in the desert and everyone's like (laughs) yeah not not for me not for me (laughs) yeah i struggle with that as well (laughs) yeah Yeah. but yeah sometimes i i really appreciate going alone we had jamie ramsey on episode five i believe and we were talking about how going alone as you said with the locals you have that vulnerability and it just makes the experience special and unique to you no one can really understand what it's like other than yourself and trying to explain it can be tricky but you have that i don't know what the word is um that sort of memory in your head which you yeah. cherish yeah exactly yeah it's the solitude i was people will ask me do you get lonely and um sometimes yes but but there's i like the solitude i don't look at it as, as loneliness I, I call it solitude and it's, it's it's very peaceful and 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 beautiful yeah yeah i agree and so how long did that expedition take that walk so it took um about one and a half months. I think I was walking for 38 days and then, you know, I'd have a, a rest week in Jerusalem and a, a few rest days here and there and everything. But it was, it was 38 days of walking. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as, as we said earlier, you're sort of going into areas which I imagine some of the audience might feel are very dangerous were there any sort of moments along the way which you were fearful yeah there were a few um i was in this uh this place in palestine called um uh oh jeez i've got what it's called it's it's just south of, of Naples. it's um it's a it's a refugee camp it's called balata balata and um basically the people who live there are exclusively palestinian refugees who used to live in tel aviv um and were, were kicked out after after um, Israel became a state, and and it's, I read an article and it said it was the most febrile, febrile place in the entire in the entire Palestinian territories, and um, I'd no I'd no idea about this. I was just following Google Maps on my phone, and it took me straight through there, and um, you know I, I, was, I was walking through there, and, and someone you know, I've got red hair, and and they, they shouted they shouted Jew at me, and uh, in, in Arabic Yehudi, and uh, they they sort of picked up a, a can of Pepsi and, and chucked it at my head. Um, I had no idea what was going on. I saw some flags um, around of, of groups that that you know some would call terrorists, uh, others would call freedom fighters. But um, I, I sort of knew 
the te- there was a lot of tension in the place and this this kind of Pepsi that was full hit me in the head. Not realizing where I was, I decided to pick up the Pepsi can, drink it, because I like Pepsi, <laughs> and um, and then sort of, yeah, stupidly, sort of sarcastically, sort of um, turn the can upside down and said, you know, shukran, thank you in Arabic, and um, and that was from in terms of people, people wise, that was that was the most scary thing on 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 any of my trips. But um, you know, had I known that that was the area I was going through was 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 that febrile, and if I'd have known the stories about the people who lived there. A, I wouldn't have gone there, and B, I wouldn't have been so stupid and sarcastic when I turned the uh, the Pepsi can upside down. When when did you realise that it was an act of hostility towards you? Did you know um, straight away, or was it yeah. like, oh, uh, is he giving me this can of Coke or Pepsi? <laughs> well, usually they would. Usually they would give me drinks and all around the all around the West Bank. But um, you know, I walked into this place and just there's, there's something there was something off about the atmosphere and. Um, yeah, this this happened, and I got out, and you know, I was, I was like, where the hell have I just been? Looked up my phone, Balata. Oh, okay, bad place. <laughs> so that's that's one to miss out on the uh, on the trip. <laughs> yes, I mean there are there are some Westerners that go there. I think the UN have got some refugee um, camps or some sort of assistance programs there. But you know, if you go in uninvited, it's 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 probably not the best idea. Yeah. And so your six week or one and a half month trip took you all the way through. After that, were you, was there a sort of feeling of, wow, I, I just want to do another one? Was that, you were sort of hooked? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it started earlier than that. The, the sort of the hook is the first trip and it just it keeps on going after that. But but that that one expedition certainly sort of, you know, reinforced my love for the Middle East and the Islamic world and, um and that's where I'll, I'll be focusing on um, in the future. Yeah. Good. And so, going through the Holy Lands, it's a sort of very spiritual um, place. Was it a sort of pilgrimage for yourself, or was it just an idea of learning about the different cultures? It was both. I am I am religious, and and that was that was its big um, big aspect of my trip to you know walk through. The places that all the prophets have been and 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 everything like that but um that was it was only part of the trip it was also to just experience a new place a new culture and, and learn about a place that's often um people have a lot of misconceptions about so yeah it's a lot of different factors all right uh and so walking i mean you you almost specialize in walking you've walked malta you've walked the netherlands israel all sorts um what is it about walking that you love so much i think it's just the 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 pace of it just because it is so slow it just forces you to take everything in you can't sort of skip through a village that that you would be if you're in car or whatever but it's just um yeah how slow it is you you, you're forced to see and take in everything you're forced to go to every every cafe that you come across in every village because you want to have a break you want to have a cup of tea or something like that so you have to stop you have to interact with everyone and and it's just it's the best way to to hear the stories of the people and that's that's what i love about it most did you get invited in for tea quite a lot then yeah yeah i mean the the first the first day i was in palestine there's about a i think two or three kilometer section from from the border with israel to to the first town janin and i just walking along this road i was i was invited in for tea or coffee at least 10 times you know i rejected i rejected most of them because i had to go to janin but um but yeah, everyone was just yeah, come in, come in, and all saying welcome, and yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it's it's an amazing experience for anyone listening. Is just people around the world are so hospitable, and just if you just let them. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with that one, but this sort of. As I say, I try and sort of promote and encourage people to sort of step out of their comfort zone and to go on these sort of big grand adventures because it opens up a whole new world. As you said, yeah. you know, us in the West, we see Palestine and Israel and we, we most of the time just see a massive political debate and trouble is probably the best word to describe it. But when you experience these countries by yourself... Yeah, 
you you come across some of the most hospitable and incredible people. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 unmatched. I, mean, I was in I was in Morocco recently, and and there is there is something there is something across across these Islamic cultures that I've that I've experienced of just of just absolute you know treating the guests as, with the utmost um, respect and um, being as hospitable as you can possibly be, and and it's, it's something we can learn from, um, and it's yeah, it's incredible. So after that trip, you you were hooked. And the idea was to do these sort of walk, walks more, basically. Yeah. So Malta, what was about Malta that attracted you there? To be honest, what attracted me to Malta was a ten euro um, Ryanair ticket. That was <laughs> that was that was that was it, really. I mean, it's it's, a, it's obviously part of the Mediterranean. It's got it's got a very rich history of, of multiple empires and, and religions. Um, uh, you know, setting themselves up there. The, Maltese itself is 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 basically a dialect of Arabic. It's the only Semitic language. It's that's an official language of the EU, and um, you know, going there was 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 incredible because you Romans, you got Ottomans, you got French, you got the British, and and um, it was it's a it's a small two the two islands are quite small. So it gave me, you know, I had a week. I was just planning to walk a hundred miles as you know circles around the islands or across islands or you know I had how I. Went, I had as much freedom as as I could give myself, and um, and yeah, it was it's just it was uh, the expedition that had the most. I I didn't plan this one per se. I didn't have I've got to be in this town and this town and this town by by this time or whatever. So, um, yeah, it was it was completely completely you know liberating in a way. Yeah. So that's how you plan your adventures. You look for the cheapest Ryanair ticket. Yeah, basically, <laughs> I'm a student. You know, <laughs> I've got to. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a bad, not a bad way to do it, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so, how do you prepare for these expeditions, these walking expeditions? Are there certain things that you always bring with you? Yeah, I mean, I always, I always bring um, some sort of survival kit or whatever, just in case something goes wrong. Never had to use it yet. Um, Apart from that, I mean, it's 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 a book and a diary and a pen. That's 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 really it. My 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 goal isn't really to to rough it out or to break any records or anything like that. It's it's just to go there and and record the stories that I see and and hear about and and try and bring them to the rest of the world. And and that's 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 my real passion. That's what I am to do. What's the craziest story you've had on your travels? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's. The, the time I almost I almost died really that's that's probably the the craziest one so um it was on the last day of walking the Holy Land and um I I was supposed to be I had to cross three mountain ranges to get to Aqaba and um the I was crossing the second mountain range and um you had to follow these shepherd's trails up and down and I lost the shepherd's trail and I saw this 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 riverbed and I was like okay, I can just follow that um then there was a waterfall which it was dry, so it was just it was just a cliff, and I thought, okay, right, I've got to turn back. Um, but I jumped down a smaller cliff to get to this this part of the the riverbed, so I was essentially stuck. And um, and there was this screech slope from this riverbed to a sort of a, a more stable area where I could get down. And I thought, okay, that's that's my only hope. So I climbed up to this screech slope and and started trying to walk across it, trying to keep my center uh, center of gravity quite low obviously not low enough I slipped quite quickly and um you know I was just sliding on my backside uh, down this 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 great slope rocks flying everywhere hitting me in the in the head and and um you know this this was a good sort of 20 30 meter drop to the to the bottom of this so even if I survived the fall easily a broken leg and it's it's at least you know 10 kilometers to crawl to the nearest town like it's, it's not going to be possible um so I saw this one boulder and I just, you know, I prayed, you know, please be stable. Um, so I grabbed onto it with all I, with all I could and, and luckily it was. And, um, and then sort of crawled to the other side of this, this, this great slope as, as slowly and as steadily as I could and, and just sort of just broke down on the other side, went to shock and, and it was, it was awful. Um, crazy in a bad way, but, uh, but certainly something to sort of look back on with, a bit of humility and and everything it was it was quite it's quite insane yeah yeah it's it's um 
those sort of moments will always live with you, but they're, I always find they always make you a little bit stronger for the next one. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. We're a little bit less stupid in this instance, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say that, but I, I thought it didn't sound so... <laughs> yeah. So poetic. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, George, there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. Yes. With the first being on your trips, what's the one gadget that you always bring with you on your trips? The one I've got this uh, Delorme Inreach. It's a uh, sort of satellite messenger, and um, and that's that's the best way that I can keep in contact with my parents. You know, my mum always wants to know where I am every day and stuff, so she can you know check I'm safe as as all mothers would. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's 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 the one thing um, I take apart from that phone camera and. I'm not a massive fan of the high tech side of things, but yeah. Yeah, my uh, when I go on trips, my family always want me to have a GPS so they can track every movement. But I find it really creepy and weird, so I'm like, no, <laughs> aeroplane mode the whole way. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is your favorite adventure or travel book? Um. See, this has changed quite recently. I used to, I used to love, um, I still do, um, Arabian Sands by Wilfred Dessiger. Um, that was that was my favourite. Um, but I've I've recently read uh, Levison Woods Arabia, and um, I just found that I found that brilliant because it's more it's more relevant to today's world and it delves into the various the countries all around um, the Arabian world and and uh, yeah, I found I found that a brilliant book. Oh, amazing. I have to check that one out. Mm. I got a signed copy as well. I was quite happy with it. <laughs> no, check you out. <laughs> um, why are adventures important to you? I think, I think to me, it's. I think it's more just um, going to a part of the world and and really broadening your own horizons, as as cliche as it sounds. Um, it's it's experiencing a new part of the world, and when you do it in in, in a adventurous an adventurous way, it's a completely unique way. The locals are going to see you and treat you different to the average tourist. Um, and and yeah, for me, that those are the big those are the big um, sort of pull factors. There's also obviously the the physical and mental challenge that I like, but um, but yeah, it's more the the experience and, and yeah, opening up. Yeah, I agree. Um, what about your favorite quote? Uh, my favorite quote is um, from one of my sort of childhood heroes, Richard Francis Burton. And um, he said that, uh, I've got it here, of the gladdest moments in human life, methinks, is the departure upon a distant journey into unknown lands, shaking off with one mighty effort the fetters of habit, the leaden weight of routine, the cloak of many cares, and the slavery of civilization. Man feels once more happy. <laughs> So that's, yeah, that's a good one. Almost, poet, <laughs> almost like a poem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something very poetic about it. No, it's a good yeah. one. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, I mean, Richard Francis Burson was was absolute madman. Like he was, uh, he did a pilgrimage to, to Mecca, um, even though he wasn't a Muslim. He, he spoke 20 different languages or something like that. An officer in the uh, British, um, British East India Company and, and, yeah, he's did everything. Yeah, and uh, is, that, is that who you model yourself on for the future? I try. Yeah, I mean, he's a bit too Victorian for me per se, but um, but yeah, he's he's definitely some sort of some sort of role model. Yeah. Um, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures, like yourself. What would you recommend to people wanting to go on these adventures? I'd say just just back yourself, really. Like, um, it's nothing more. I mean, planning's planning's hard, and if you just planning's the hardest bit. And it's when you take that first step of the journey that's that's when it becomes easier. And and once you're there, just just believe in yourself. It's going to get hard, but um, but yeah, you just believe in you in yourself. You have make sure. I always write down my motivation for doing any trip. So if I'm feeling if I'm feeling shit one day, I'll just you know open open my diary and just read that to myself. So um, that that's that helps me but um but yeah just just back yourself really that's quite a good idea actually i haven't i haven't actually ever done that before write your motivations before the trip yeah it's 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 great it's just yeah every time you know i was, I was in morocco recently and you know, i was in a walk there and i sprained my ankle two days 
you know, before I, I finished the trip and, you know, I just opened it up and thought, okay, right, take some painkillers and just soldier on. And, and sure enough, I got there in the end. So, yeah, I was, I was speaking on the podcast uh, a few weeks back and saying it is the, always the first step, which is the most terrifying. But as soon as you break that first step, you're like, oh, yeah. okay, this is just walking. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. like you it's all in your head. It's, yeah. yeah, it's all in your head. It's like you just take each day as it comes, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. you walking from, let's say, one length for the length of Britain. Just think of yourself yeah. just going, you're just walking to the next door town first. Yeah, yeah, And then exactly. just carrying yeah. on. And eventually yeah. you'll be like, oh, this is actually quite easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it won't become fun. It's it's not fun when you walk, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's not as hard as, as people think. I think it opens yeah. up more opportunities, though, because you're at sort of eye level with the locals, and so yeah. it encourages more interaction. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the beauty of walking. Um, George, what are you doing now, and how can people follow and find you? So at the moment, um, I'm writing my book about my journey in Morocco. I walked the length of the Sousse River, which was 250 kilometers from um, its source in uh, the High Atlas Mountains to the sea. That's due to come out on the 1st of May. Um, it will be out on, on Amazon, uh, I'll self-publish. And uh, so after that, I'm planning to go to uh, Turkey and Iraq and, and I'll do a walk there. But, um, but yeah, you can follow everything I do on on, uh, on Instagram. You can find all the links to my books and and to the, the YouTube video I posted recently. It's it's not it's not amazing. It's just some pictures with some music. <laughs> but um, but yeah. So it's it'll all be there at George Kefford is my Instagram. Um, just my name, no spaces or, or dots or underscores or anything. It's yeah, all there. Oh, you kept that that little trip quiet. Was that? I thought that was the next question. <laughs> but okay, yeah. So um, well, no, no. So, the next question is usually <laughs> what's next. But I didn't know about the Morocco trip. Ah, yeah. So um, yeah, that was I uh, recently did. Um, I went to Morocco over Christmas to uh, spent four weeks there studying Arabic. I fell a bit behind in uh, my university Arabic here. I don't particularly like learning Arabic online, but um, so I went to Morocco and and studied in a school for four weeks, and um, after that decided to do a walk um across uh, along one of the rivers and um yeah it was it was beautiful then i could you know actually practice my my language a bit more than what i had before and uh yeah just the, the hospitality just repeated itself as it uh, as it was in the um in the middle east so uh yeah incredible yeah i suppose if you are speaking arabic to them they're probably a little bit surprised and they're, they're almost like, oh, well, my God, an Arabic speaker, come on in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, most of the most of the journey was, was through a region where the people, their first language is, uh, is, is called Tash al which is which is quite different to quite different to Arabic. But, um, but you know, they, they, they learn Arabic in school. They have to when because it's, it's you know, religiously mandated to to be able to read and understand the Quran in Morocco. So they will understand Arabic, Arabic well. But yeah. Um, I didn't unfortunately I, I didn't learn any of any of their language which was which I was quite angry at myself with to be honest because it's a very very unique and beautiful culture and um yeah next time <laughs> yeah there's hopefully always the next time yeah <laughs> well George thank you so much for coming on the show today thank you yeah I really enjoyed it it's been an absolute pleasure listening to your stories and as I as I was saying I look forward to following your adventures in the future especially the next one in iraq and kurdistan yes yeah looking forward to it so uh yeah the kurdistan walk will be 800 kilometers across uh from from diyarbakir to halabja in iraq so you know once again through going through some you know somewhat politically unstable territory but you know my aim is to go there and find the good news stories and and to show to shed a different light on on the part of the world so Hopefully it'll be good, inshallah, as, as the Muslims say. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on today. And as I say, I think everyone listening, your stories have been really interesting. And, you know, I, we've had many people on, but I don't think too many have covered this part of the world. So it's always nice to get a fresh... I'm glad I could. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.